Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Our speaker tonight is Chris Taylor. Just a few words to introduce Chris before we get started. Chris joined Pioneer 20 years ago as a grain market analyst after working in the farmer-owned cooperative system in Iowa. Today, he's a senior economist for Corteva AgriScience, where he's responsible for producing short and long-term quantitative global agricultural forecasts that Corteva uses in business planning and risk assessment. Chris's expertise in the ag economic outlook has been well regarded among customers, industry, and other stakeholders. Chris earned a bachelor's degree in ag business and an MBA from Iowa State University. Chris, thanks again for hosting us this evening. I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Mark, and thanks again to everybody for inviting me to visit with you tonight. Uh, my goal for this evening's presentation is to give you all an idea of how we are looking at the markets in 2019 and through 2020. I want to give you a sense for our overall economic outlook. I want to give you a sense for the types of questions that management has been asking of us the last few months, uh, a sense for the types of questions customers have been asking of us the last few months and how we're answering those questions. I won't tell you that I've got all the answers this evening because I certainly don't, but I do want to give you some insight into how we are thinking about the markets this year and for the types of things we are thinking about as most important for the markets as we head into the 2019 planting season. And I'm going to do that starting out with three or four slides on the overall global crop outlook the overall global situation and how it's impacting us here in the U.S. We're going to take a look at some of the USDA numbers that they released at the Outlook Forum a couple years ago. I'm going to give you some of my ideas on those numbers and some of our ideas on what that means for the upcoming U.S. crop season. And at the end, I've got a few slides on the farm bill and some longer-term final thoughts that I think would be important for everybody to keep in uh, as we move through 2019 here. Okay, my first slide looking at the global situation. On the left side, we've got ending stocks of global corn, wheat, and soybeans. And on the right side, ending stocks to use. A couple messages I want you to take from this slide. Uh, the first is that we are at or near all-time highs for ending stocks for, for corn, wheat, and soybeans. Uh, Soybeans setting, expected to set a new record high for global stocks this year, and I would say it's the, it's the soybean supply that the market perceives as particularly burdened. But we have seen global corn stocks and wheat stocks tighten here recently. A little more perspective on the global situation. We looked at ending stocks on the last slide, and on, the, on this slide, ending stocks is represented by the blue lines. The gray shaded area is production, and the red line is consumption. And global consumption growth for almost all agriculture products has been very impressive. We continue to set records for many grains, oil seeds, and meat products. It's just been that production has been equally impressive. You probably all saw uh, a couple months ago some of the data revisions that China put through on some of their his uh, uh, historical data for grains and oil seeds. So on the next slide here, I took China out. And the point that I want you to take from this one is, is again, that global corn and wheat ending stocks, the blue line there, has rolled over. In contrast, soybeans on the right side there, ending stocks continue to grow and production continues to outrun consumption outside of China, that yellow space at the top there. That's a, a concept I want you to keep in mind here uh, as we go through the rest of the talk tonight. And it's really been both global planted area and global yields that have contributed to these big crops. In general, the market has had a pretty good handle on global planted area. What I mean by that is it's been several years since there's been a surprise about planted area of a major crop in a major producing region. It really has been yield that has surprised the market. 
And my, my message on this slide is that global yields of grain and oil seeds have outrun trend the last six years in a row. And you can see on the, on the right side there, that's kept some pressure on price. Increasingly here, we've seen the market begin to accept the idea that we maybe are at a new plateau for global yields. That's kept pressure on prices. It's also taken a fair amount of volatility out of the grain markets here the last, the last three or four years. Right. So heading into the U.S. outlook here, same slide we looked at for global, but it, it's U.S. now, probably a little bit more dramatic. Ending stocks of soybeans expected to be at or, or actually a record by quite a ways, but we have drawn down corn and wheat stocks the last two years in a row. Now, normally, when we see this type of a relationship, we would expect two things to happen. We would expect um, a, a little bit of a, an increase in grain prices, corn especially, corn and wheat prices, and we would expect to see a shift from soybean planted area to corn, wheat, and other crops. All right. We have not seen much of a reaction out of the corn market so far, largely because the market expects that soybeans will lose some planted area to other crops here in 2019. And that is exactly what the USDA suggested uh, will happen here a couple weeks ago at their outlook forum. They expect corn to pick up 3 million acres or so. They expect soybeans to lose about 4 million. Uh, they expect spring wheat to be up four or 500,000. I don't show it on here, but they also expect cotton area to be up, okay? Um, they also expect uh, flat to higher farm prices for most crops. I don't have too much to argue with here on USDA's overall trend and, and crop mix in 2019. I do think the market is starting to get a little nervous about the spring wheat planting window and the corn planting window in some states and is starting to wonder if we actually will see this big of a shift in planted area. The other thing that the market is, I think, questioning on the USDA numbers is the soybean average price increase from the 2018 crop to 19 crop. I think we would need to see the market come up a little bit uh, for that to happen. So let's, let's take a look at corn here for a minute, and I, I don't intend to drag you through all these numbers this evening. We've already looked at the planted area estimate from USDA, and I want to talk a little bit on the next few slides about their demand estimates. USDA does expect record export demand for corn, right? They expect flat uh, ethanol demand and a little bit of an increase in, in feed and residual use. So higher exports, higher feed and residual use, but flat ethanol. And largely that's because of uh, the pressure that we've seen in ethanol margins, which is on the, the left side of my chart here. Um, we've had quite a drop in crude oil prices and gasoline prices here the last few months, but it really has not translated into much of an increase in miles driven or extra gasoline consumption. Uh, I do think there on the right side that, that corn demand for ethanol will continue to be a, a big market for ethanol, but it's going to be slow growth, okay? There are a couple things on the horizon here to think about for ethanol going forward. The E15 regulation waivers due out this summer, uh, I do think will help ethanol demand a little on the margins, but again, I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be slow growth as retailers decide to add pumps and, and sell E15, okay? Um, there's been some stories out about China likely including distillers grains and or corn and or ethanol in some of their promised purchases from the trade perspective. Um, that would certainly help. Uh, especially if the volumes are big enough to, to impact global ethanol economics. So um, my outlook here for margins to get a little better here in the 2018 crop, and I, I don't show it here, but again, a, a little better in the 2019 crop as well for ethanol. 
On the livestock side, uh, we, we, we looked at USDA's estimate for an increase in feed use there. Um, we're expecting another year here in 2019 of record pork, beef, and poultry production here in the United States. And the pork, beef, and poultry herds all expected to be record large here in, in 2019. Uh, record herd sizes, good for feed demand, okay? Not so good for livestock margins, of course. Um, we're seeing a little bit of pressure on hogs. And again, with some, some trade, you know, some hopeful trade news coming through that, that could help prices there. The cow-calf side looks to be under particular pressure uh, on the beef side. I'm showing dairy on the right side of this chart. Dairy has been pretty tight, and we expect dairy to be pretty tight through most of 2019, though I do see uh, a little bit of improvement in milk prices here at the middle and the end of the year because of, of global prices. Uh, so I, I, I um, see a tight year for livestock margins, but uh, pretty solid feed demand there. I want to spend a couple minutes on this slide because it um, addresses, uh, I think it does a pretty good job of addressing our outlook for corn uh, and probably a little bit corn price here the next 18 months or so. The left side of the chart is corn ending stocks in the bars there, and the price is the black and yellow line. And note that that chart is not sorted by year, it's sorted by ending stocks, right? Okay, so the higher the ending stocks, the lower the price and vice versa. That's a pretty uh, easy concept that, that, that everybody's comfortable with. On the right side of this chart, I've got some different area forecasts. Um, USDA in the middle there at 92 and some other ideas to think about. And the, the point I want you to take home from this chart is that even with an increase in corn area to 92 million acres here in 2019, we're not likely to build ending stocks here of corn in the U.S. very much, assuming some of our current demand estimates hold, okay? And we think that that keeps some support under corn price into 2020. And I've got corn futures, the December contract on this chart. The black line is 2019, and the other lines are the last three years. Through most of 2019 here, December corn futures have been above the level we were the last three or four years. So I think to some extent the market is recognizing that the corn situation is tighter. We've sold off here a little bit the last couple weeks, kind of into the middle of that range. Not too unusual, all right, for there there is a, a pretty strong seasonal that can that can catch you in February to put pressure on corn price. It looks to, to us like corn futures are poised to kind of trade the seasonal here into planting, especially if we get some help from, from um, market concerns about weather. Uh, the other piece would be if there is a breakthrough on the China trade situation, I think that would help us get a, a little bit of a, uh, our, our normal expected spring rally on, on corn as well. Uh, I will say, given that the supply overhang globally, we looked at a few slides ago, I do think when these opportunities present themselves, uh, we all need to be, to be looking at, at, at taking them, okay? Okay, a few slides uh, to, to think about the global trade situation on soybeans before we look at the soybean outlook. Um, on this chart, I've got Brazil soybean export prices, which is the green line, and the dark blue line is U.S. export prices at the Gulf. And for most of the fall and winter here, we saw quite a spread between the two markets. Um, with Brazil having quite a bit higher soybean export prices than the U.S., and they came back together here uh, about the middle of January. This is kind of a good news, bad news thing, I think, from a, from a U.S. perspective. The good news is the fact that these prices came back together shows that the market does expect China to buy soybeans out of the U.S. when it needs to do so, okay? 
that they may, may go into the state reserves, which are not subject to the to the tariff. But um, the market doesn't believe we're going to see too many problems uh, with trade going forward. The bad news, I think, is that the Brazil price came down to the U.S. price, all right, which in, in our mind suggests that the U.S. soybean price probably was the accurate reflection of global soybean prices all along, all right. And <clears throat> there's a couple of things to think about, I think, longer term when we're, when we're, when we're thinking about soybeans here. Um, that price spread that we saw on the last slide did indeed provide an incentive for growers in Brazil to plant more soybeans. All right, so on this on this slide, green means that state in Brazil planted more soybeans last fall, the crop that they're harvesting now. And several of those states planted less corn, especially first crop corn. Now, I think it's probably likely that Brazil in total ends up planting more total corn year over year, depending on how the Safrina crop goes. Um, but definitely Brazil producer was reacting to that soybean price spread uh, that was in, in effect for most, most of the last several months. So uh, thinking about that a little bit here in, in the longer term soybean outlook, the left side of this slide is U.S., Brazil, and Argentina soybean production, and the right side is China soybean demand. Uh, the blue, the top part there being what they import, and the, the black at the bottom being what they produce themselves. And a, a, a couple ideas I'd have you take from this slide. It, both the U.S. and Brazil do now produce more soybeans than China uses. Okay, now that doesn't mean the U.S. will definitely go to one or the other to buy all their soybeans. Both markets have a domestic market that, that bids against that for, for crush. But the, soy, the, 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 the export market, the global export market, has gotten a lot more competitive. And it's come at a time where you can see on the right side there that China soybean demand has rolled over. And it rolled over even before this trade issue. It started back in 2017. I think part of it is due to their... Uh, economic slowdown, I think part of it is due to African swine fever. You can see several years there where China increased its soybean demand every single year, almost regardless of price. And we're in an environment now where I think that demand is going to be a little more volatile and a little more price conscious than it has been in the past. Right? And that's been going on for some time. Uh, the right side of this chart is export market share for soybeans between North America and South America. And again, you can see this shift from China buying South American beans had started really a few years ago uh, before the current trade issue. Okay, In contrast to corn where it's kind of leveled out to where both hemispheres have about the same amount of, of uh, global corn market share. Okay. So, Thinking about beans here, um, the next couple of slides. USDA expects record crush in 2019. I agree we probably will see another real strong year of crush. Crush margins have been pretty good. We've seen some expansion of crush here in North America, new, new facilities. That's a longer term positive, but again, it's slow growth. USDA expects US to get at least some of that China export business back. Again, I don't disagree with that. I think the, the question is how much. And, and again, talking about price there towards the bottom, a, a small increase in price this year. I think that largely depends on where acres finally come out in, in, in the March report. And I, again, I think the market is starting to suspect we may see more than 85 million acres by the time it's all over due to, due to weather, largely due to weather. All right. Same slide on for soybeans that we looked at for corn, all right? Um, 18, 19 stocks likely to be a, a record by a, a, a long ways, right? And then on the right side there are acreage scenarios for soybeans, again with the USDA and the blue bar, the 85 million acres. I've got an extra line on this chart, that the red line on the right side there, where we estimated how many soybeans China would buy if they came fully back into the U.S. market. 
at the same level they were before the trade talks, okay? The point I want you to take from this slide is that even with an acreage cut to soybeans, it doesn't look like we'll draw down ending soybean stocks much, if at all. If exports pick up, China comes completely back to the market, we would still have the second or third highest soybean ending stocks by quite a ways. So I think the situation here in the U.S. with big soybean stocks uh, stays with us for a while, and I think that keeps some pressure on crop economics to a point that it continues this shift from soybeans to corn, wheat, and other crops probably beyond 2019, okay? Um, soybean prices, okay, so again, I've got 2019 futures um, compared to the last three or four years here, and the soybean futures for 2019, despite um, all we've talked about about global supply and U.S. supply, is again kind of right in the middle of the range that we've seen for this time of year, the last three or four years. So there's not a strong signal from the soybean market on what we should be doing in terms of marketing. And we're in the, in the, in the time of year here where the seasonal tends to be pretty flat, right? Um, it doesn't really start to do much until we get into, into corn planting in April, one, one direction or the other. Um, two, two points I'd make, make to you from this one. A breakthrough on trade talks with China probably would get us uh, push, push closer back up to $10, um, you know, and again, the, the timing of the normal spring rally that we would um, expect. Um, that's being uh, counteracted a little bit by the market's expectation for more soybean area than what USDA expects, okay? So, again, the market's right in the middle based on those two factors. The other thing I'd have you think about is regardless of what the, the soybean market tends to do the first half of the year, there is a tendency for it to start to break pretty hard in June. So one way or another, if you don't have uh, 2019 soybeans priced or very many priced, I would, I would certainly recommend a time stop in there where by the time soybean planting is over in May, you're thinking very hard about um, getting some 2019 soybeans priced uh, because of that strong tendency for, for soybeans to, prices to do something in summer, whether they've uh, rallied in the spring or not. Um, the overall fundamentals for soybeans suggest a, uh, more price pressure to come. Uh, I, I, I do still think there's some opportunity for a little bit of a rally here in spring, but we need some things to break, break our way for that to happen. A couple of comments on wheat. Uh, we looked earlier at USDA's expectation for winter wheat area to be down year over year, or for total wheat area to be down year over year, about 800,000 acres. Um, USDA estimated U.S. winter wheat area down about 1.3 million, you know, one of the lowest total wheat, winter wheat areas we've had in the U.S. Uh, since the early 1900s, and largely because of the overly wet conditions we had in the southern plains through the mid-Atlantic late last fall. Okay, so if you Think about that number at the bottom of this chart, the, the minus 1.25 million acres of winter wheat. When you're looking at the overall wheat table, you can kind of back into the idea that USDA expects four or 500,000 more acres of spring wheat this year, again, probably coming out of soybeans. I don't disagree with the economics on, on that. The, the, the price relationship suggests that should happen. I do think the market is starting to suspect that we're going to get pretty tight on the spring wheat planting window. That has helped spring wheat prices keep some premium to winter wheat prices, though the whole wheat complex has been pretty weak here the last uh, month or so. Like corn and soybeans, I think it's too early to write off the idea of a spring wheat rally, especially as the market gets a little more nervous about acres. But this is another market where we're all going to have to be ready to take advantage of the opportunity when it when it comes. Okay. A couple more slides thinking about um, our opinion of 2019 planted area. 
one of the one of the factors, one of the metrics we look at is corn to soybean new crop futures prices to give us an idea of what the market is trying to do and what the market thinks is going to happen when the crop gets planted. All we're doing here is taking new crop soybean futures and dividing it by corn futures. And the historical theory there is the higher the ratio is, the more soybeans you should expect. The lower the ratio is, the more corn you should expect. And the 2019 number is that thick red line there, kind of right in the middle. Again, it's kind of in a neutral position, right? Not a strong uh, signal from the market in terms of market shift, but you can see that it is quite a bit below the 2017 and 2018 ratios that drove almost 90 million acres of soybeans here in the U.S. So from a futures perspective, uh, the market's not signaling a big shift, but it's the cash market doing the work through basis that is trying to trying to make that shift happen. And um, again, I, I don't disagree too much with the with the USDA numbers or the uh, overall market perception of, of not trying to shift a lot of acres. But when you consider this ratio compared to the last two years, um, it does suggest, at least from a pure economics perspective, not thinking about weather here for quite quite for a second, uh, a, a pretty good shift out of beans. If you looked at this ratio, beans versus wheat, it suggests more spring wheat. If you look at this ratio, actually if you look at corn and soybeans versus cotton, it, it, it suggests more cotton area as well. So our estimate for planted area shift this year in the U.S. is going to be pretty regional in nature. Um, the economic perspective anyway would be that you would see this shift happen in the Dakotas you would see it happen in the Southern Plains. You would see it happen in the Southeast and not as much through the center of the, of the Corn Belt. The crop insurance revenue uh, guarantee prices are set in February. Again, not a big shift here. We're kind of right in the middle of the range we've been in the last four or five years. Although soybean insurance prices are down enough from last year to, that would probably um, try to shift a little more area into corn, especially for those uh, lenders that use crop, uh, revenue crop insurance as one of their benchmarks for profitability and, um, and, and lending metrics. So, you know, again, I think the market here is reflecting the idea that corn's a little tighter with a little bit higher corn guarantee price but it's also recognizing that we've got a lot of soybeans and, and, and the soybean insurance price is down from the last few years. These charts are all of the private analysts, the brokers and trading house planted area estimates that we follow. And we put the USDA number in there just kind of for reference. The trend on these is pretty clear. Basically, everybody is expecting more corn area this year and everybody is expecting less bean area this year. What is different about this year is how narrow the high to low ranges are on both crops for March, especially for soybeans. This is one of the narrowest ones that, that we had in our archive going back uh, 10 or 15 years. So it does feel to me like the, the market is probably setting up for a little bit of a surprise on, on soybean area and, and, and USDA's March report one direction or the other. Um, you know, and again, I think weather would suggest it could be a little higher. Economics su 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 suggests it should be a little lower. But uh, this type of narrow range is typically what sets you up for some type of a pretty volatile market move uh, the first part of April. And we've talked quite a bit about weather and uh, temperatures this year, this winter. Uh, one of the top five coldest February and March periods for the uh, upper Midwest and Corn Belt on record. We've also got, well, I think the market's perception is that topsoil and subsoil moisture is at capacity for pretty much the entire uh, agricultural region east of the Rocky Mountains. Two ideas here, okay. Again, this is part of what's keeping the market nervous about a, uh, uh, the spring thaw and flooding issues and having trouble getting the crop planted. Once the crop is planted, a full soil moisture profile like this 
will lead the market to think we've probably got a chance at some pretty good yields here again in, in 2019. Okay, so um, again, if anything, it supports a little bit of a, a market rally here early in the season, and then once the market is comfortable that the crop is planted, um, we'll get comfortable with yields pretty quick if there's if there's any precip in the in the in the forecast at all. Again, argues for taking advantage of some marketing opportunities when they present themselves. Um, I've got three or four slides here on the farm bill then that was passed uh, late last year, and um, there are three or four key things here that I think it would pay for any producer to keep in mind here this summer uh, heading into the sign-up period late in 2019. Um, the first was that there was not much of a change in crop insurance, which I'm looking at as good news, okay? They did make some modifications to the ARC and PLC program, um, one that you'll be able to choose which program you want uh, year to year. And the last one is they, they or the, not the last one, but another key one that I think is that they raised the loan rates for most crops if you're taking advantage of that program. I've got the loan rates in the in the table at the bottom right hand of this of this chart. Um, so, as we've analyzed this program, our estimate is that most producers will choose PLC under the farm bill, uh, which is different than what what happened on the last farm bill, where almost all producers chose our our county for their uh, election on the Farm Bill. We think it's gonna flip-flop and almost all producers will choose PLC. In addition, if you choose PLC, you can update your yields for PLC and our work suggests that almost all producers will wanna take a hard look at that as well. I borrowed these two maps from FAPRI at the University of Missouri but our work aligns, aligns very close to the work they did down there. What these maps are telling you is if you operate in a county that's colored dark blue on these charts, you will want to take a very hard look at updating your PLC yields under the new farm bill. Right? If you're operating in one of the whiter, white shaded counties, that doesn't mean you won't benefit, it just doesn't, it just means, it, it's likely that most producers won't or most producers updated under the previous farm bill. Either way, I would suggest you all take a very uh, uh, hard look at updating your yields under the new farm bill because I do think there's some value in it for corn and soybean producers both. You'll have the opportunity to switch um, um, ARC or PLC after the first two years, you'll be able to to, to change your election each year after that. Um, so you'll have plenty of time to, to look at the market and make some decisions and look at, at yields and so forth year to year, but this yield work will need to be done uh, when you sign up, okay? Okay, um, my last slide here, and then I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, you know, global fundamentals and U U.S. fundamentals suggest grain and oil seeds are very well supplied, okay? It's really weather and um, some of these last minute USDA updates that we think is gonna add uncertainty around 2019 planet area outlook, that'll add the market uh, volatility, that'll give you an opportunity to take some, some pricing opportunities when they're available. And, and given the, the, the supply overhang we looked at tonight, I do think you better uh, uh, take a hard look at some of those opportunities when they come. Thinking about trade here, um, trade has been in the news quite a bit the last few weeks because it, um, the, the implication being that the U.S. and China may sign a trade agreement uh, you know, sometime here in the month of March. There's been news of promised purchases, uh, U.S announced a couple of days ago that they would suspend indefinitely the idea that they would put any more tariffs on China. They haven't removed any, but they haven't put any new ones on. All of this suggests to us the talks are progressing and there may be a deal at some point. We just don't know the timing. 
Okay. When it, if an agreement is reached and agreements are signed, it likely will have a positive impact on the market in the short term. Meaning, I, I do think we'd see a market rea a, a market market reaction higher in the short term. But the the impact of the trade issue is probably long term before we see any real um, price change here in the U.S. Largely because of the time of year we're entering here. This is the time of year that China would switch to buying beans and other crops from South America anyway. So it could be harvest time or, or, or more likely early 2020 before um, China purchases move the market enough for, for the U.S. producer to, to benefit. And then my last point there, um, <clears throat> the farm bill adjustments and specifically the the adjustment that uh, lets people in, uh, update their PLC yields does show the value of maintaining yield potential. Um, the crop insurance program uh, rewards higher yields over time, and of course, with, with prices like this, the, the market's actually rewarding yield, right? Not not re rewarding the producer through yield, not through through price. You know, I, I know uh, there are some lenders out there pushing the idea, and 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 others of of, of, of uh, you know, being very cost conscious on inputs this year, and the economics. Um, you know, help that argument a little bit, but it is riskier long term to, if, we're, if we're taking chances on our fertility or our genetics programs. Um, there is value that gets capitalized back into the land and back into the operation through the farm bill and through crop insurance uh, if, you're, if you're maintaining increasing yield potential over time. All right. Well, that's my last prepared comment. Um, I guess I'd be happy, Mark or Christian, to take any questions that come uh, from the group. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, as we move to the question and answer portion of the call, please feel free to place yourself into the question queue by pressing pound two or hash two on your telephone keypad. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, you can state your question. To submit a written question, you can use the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen and choose all panelists from the Sensu drop-down menu. And just so everybody knows, they, your question will be addressed anonymously. Okay, Chris, can you hear me? I sure can. All right, great. So I can see a few questions that have come in here on the chat panel, and, and perhaps there'll be a few more as we hit a few of these that have come in already. So I'll just start from the earliest questions that came in. Uh, you spoke earlier about E15 and the impact that that could have in the marketplace. Can, so it sounds like that could be slow to have some effect. It, maybe it's baked into the marketplace already. Could you speak more to that? And could you also comment on the oil industry's reaction to E15 and, and the prospect of upping ethanol consumption? Sure. So what, what the E15 uh, waiver regulation was designed to do was allow uh, retailers who want to sell E15 to do that. And so it's a little different than the original E10 volume standard where uh, retailers had to, or, or blenders, refiners, had to either blend uh, up to 10% or uh, buy RINs to make up for their obligation. This is more of a, a, a program where you, you can sell E15 if you want to. And there are retailers taking advantage of the, of the uh, pump upgrades uh, to do this. So uh, I think some of it's being driven by the, the, the need to get the new card readers and so on. But the point is, E15, uh, the E15 waiver, if, when it comes this summer, will be a positive, but it will be slow growth, right? It'll initially be aimed at, or I think uh, demand growth would be aimed at the upper Midwest, where ethanol is the cheapest and the, the biggest desire for a retailer to, to do that. So it, it's going to be slow growth, not like the ethanol build out we saw 10 or 15 years ago, uh, slow growth, but positive growth. Your second question about the oil industry's reaction to that. Um, you've probably all seen in the news some of the stories about the REN waivers that were afforded by EPA 
to refineries that could prove uh, economic hardship uh, from having to acquire RINs or um, to, through, through blending ethanol. Originally, that part of the renewable fuel standard was designed to excuse refineries that were well away from the Corn Belt or didn't have access to ethanol refineries nearby. If they could prove an economic hardship, they could apply for a RIN waiver and be granted one by the EPA. Um, under the last EPA administrator, they've got a lot more lenient with some of those waivers, and there were several uh, oil companies that took advantage of those, those RIN waivers and would apply for them on a plant-by-plant -plant basis rather than a company-by-company -company basis. I do think that impacted RIN demand, which indirectly has impacted ethanol demand, or sorry, yeah, ethanol margins, ethanol demand and margins. I don't know that that demand comes back immediately, even if EPA stops uh, granting those waivers, but I, I do think they understand the issue uh, a, little, a little better now and have heard enough uh, from, from farm country that, that they'll be a little more careful how those waivers are administered, um, which is a, another reason why my ethanol margin outlook, while it was still negative there for 2018, uh, gets a little better in 18 and, and, and better in 2019. Okay, thanks for that. Let's talk for a minute about the global economy and, and currencies around the globe. With the strength in our economy and our dollar, how's that impacting commodity prices and, and what's our outlook in that space, Chris? Yeah, so uh, the general theory on currencies is that a strong dollar, a strong U.S. dollar, makes our commodities less affordable on the, on the world market or less competitive on the world market and a weaker dollar makes our currencies more competitive or more affordable on the world market. And we, we've seen a couple of things happen here the last three or four years in the currency market, um, really with two of our main competitors for global grain and oilseed exports, one being South America and the other being the Black Sea region or the former Soviet Union, Russia and Ukraine. And that is that currencies for Brazil, currency for Argentina, currency for Russia, and currency for Ukraine all got dramatically weaker against the U.S. dollar, uh, and they got weaker fairly fairly quickly. Okay, so that has really amplified some of this trade issue, right? So if if a if a uh, export customer was already on the fence uh, about buying from the U.S. Uh, for whatever reason, politics or whatever reason, um, price uh, moved away from us fast enough that it kind of made the decision for them, okay? The other thing that's happened in the currency markets is that they've gotten a lot more volatile, all right? And part of that is because of um, economic problems in those same countries, especially in South America. So as the, as the Fed here has raised interest rates the last few quarters, that has made more investors want to own dollars because they can earn a, a slightly higher return through interest rates and made the dollar stronger. Now, when the Fed came out um, a few weeks ago and said they were going to um, be more data dependent and not, uh, and, and that, that suggested to people that they may make a pause here on raising interest rates and that backed off interest rates, and I think that probably puts a little pressure on the dollar here this summer. Uh, probably not enough to overcome what we were talking here tonight with supplies, uh, but I think over the longer term that, that, that puts a little pressure on the dollar. Okay. So you mentioned wheat earlier and also the fact that it's been one of the harder winters that we can recall. We're cold up here, Chris. Can you comment on the USDA's assessment of the winter wheat crop at this point? Sure. Uh, overall, the winter wheat crop is perceived as in uh, relatively decent shape. Um, winter kill isn't perceived as a big problem at this time, though uh, remember uh, the map we looked at earlier that showed planted area was down quite a bit. 
especially in some in some of the bigger uh, winter wheat states. So it, I, I don't think there's much of a chance it breaks dormancy early, um, but I, 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 I don't think the market is too concerned right now about uh, winter wheat yields coming out of uh, or, or coming into the in, into the 2019 harvest. Fair enough. As it relates to uh, the 2019 commodity forecast and beef and pork in particular prices, uh, can we speak to those, Chris? And and what factors in the marketplace are are forcing substitution and um, our competitive effects in those markets? You mentioned the swine fever earlier as one. Yeah. Okay. So I'll start with pork there. Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I think initially the swine fever issue drove the market to believe there was an opportunity to export more pork to China, and that may happen. I think it reacted a little bit uh, to too much to the downside here, um, and, 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 and what caused pork prices to sell off or hog prices to sell off was as China has tried to deal with this swine flu issue, they've liquidated a lot of herd, and that softened a lot of global demand. My concern here for U.S. prices is just the, the sheer number of hogs and the sheer num amount of pork that it appears will be coming at us here in 2019 and into 2020. Domestic meat demand has really held up pretty good um, here, here in the U.S. And, and, and in a lot of developed country, countries. Pork is probably the one place where I think the trade agreement would help the most. But again, you know, it might be a little bit of a, a longer-term uh, price impact there. Now, on the beef side, there's a couple different things going on there. Uh, the last cattle report here from from last week did show that we're finally starting to see the uh, the uh, the beef cow herd uh, slow growth a little bit. We'd had several years of really good economics. We'd had several years of really good weather, and both th those things combined have, have generated quite a large um, increase in the cow-calf herd, and we're starting to see that slow finally. Now, thinking about 2019 and 2020 economics, um, be be because of that, I think feeder prices are going to come under some pressure here in 19 and 20 and, and put some pressure on cow-calf margins, as we, as we saw on the chart there. Beef uh, feedlot margins may, may actually end up being okay. Again, beef demand, especially for higher value cuts, has been really strong, and beef exports have held up really well. So, so the feedlot side may may do okay here for a little bit, being in a little bit better position to, to uh, negotiate for feeders and and and, and corn prices uh, working for them as well. The uh, live cattle futures, yeah, sorry, live cattle futures have have actually outrun my forecast a little bit here. They've been stronger than I than I kind of expected because of the demand side, um, the pork side, the the uh, hog futures have been a little weaker, but I, I think we're starting to see some signs of those uh, stabilizing here. Chris, I was just going to add another question uh, around margins. It it seems beef products in our retail marketplace are, are pretty stable and, as you said, pretty strong, too. And yet those margins at the producer, maybe the cow-calf or the feeder level, seem to be pretty volatile. Have, have we seen in recent, in recent times, the last couple of years, some fundamental shift in the packer's ability to maintain margins through captive supply? Well, certainly I think you've seen that on the, on the poultry side and, and to some extent on the pork side. Um, you know, I, I think on the on the beef side, they they've tried to do it more so through uh, retail pricing, right, rather, rather than the, the, the on, on the product side. Um, you know, I, the argument being, um, even with bigger beef supplies, they really haven't seen supermarket prices back up back off much on on beef, like you have um, uh, pork and poultry. And so, is, is the you know are you are you maybe missing out on a little substitution demand there that beef rightfully rightfully should have had? I, I think it seems like they're they they've tried to maintain that a little more on the retail side than on the than on the uh, on the live side. If that makes sense. You bet. And and we'll shift gears here for just a second. I have another good question and one that's really on everybody's mind. I think uh, we know up here in the Upper Midwest where we're particularly um, uh, subject to the Pacific 
Northwest export markets and whatnot. Our basis is a little weak up here right now. Could you speak to the potential impact on, on basis in this level if we do see a large shift in acreage to corn in particular? Yeah, so I <clears throat> certainly if there was a, a substantial shift in acres to corn, it would put a it would put a little pressure on, on corn basis. I'm not quite as worried about the the impact on corn basis just because again I think ethanol demand is gonna be pretty strong. I think feed demand is gonna be is gonna be, be there and I see exports uh, holding up pretty well even if they don't quite make USDA's numbers. So I, I would not foresee a corn basis problem um, like we saw with soybean basis this past season, um, even even with higher acres. I mean, that, that doesn't mean there would be no pressure, um, but I think, you know, in general, corn demand has the potential to hold in uh, a, a little better than the soybean basis did, given how dependent we were on, on, on soybean exports, especially your region uh, with all the beans going west. Um, that, that was a little bit different situation. Uh, than what we where we are using most of our our corn domestically. Very good. Uh, here's another one with expected soybean acres and and just trend line yields alone, Chris. How long in years do you think it it could take to uh, work down some of this oversupply situation, particularly in soybean? Wow. Okay. Um, well, you know, the, the chart we looked at tonight would suggest that it, it sticks with us at least into the 2020 growing season. And I think from then, from, from that point on, it depends how many more acres we, we would ship next year. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, you're probably just, just based on the numbers we looked at tonight, you would be looking at two years to get it back below that three to 400 or back to the three or 400 million that we were kind of looking at as normal. Um, a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't know that we'll see the, the shift to happen that fast, but um, you know, we're, for, for sure we're looking at pretty big stocks of soybeans here in the U.S. in uh, this year and next. Okay. Um, maybe as alternative crops go and, and just you know, given some of the price forecasts, the, the weather situation, which is always unpredictable. Uh, well, if you had to call a shot, Chris, is it a good year to roll the dice on planting a little more spring wheat? Well, certainly the economics are telling you to plant some more spring wheat, um, and it wouldn't, um, you know, I wouldn't question that decision. I think it probably comes more down to, uh, you know, the, the weather and uh, how how we do on the planting window. Um, I for sure would be keeping a, a close eye on that market, especially if we get a, a little bit of a rally here in the spring. Uh, but I, I guess I can't argue with that decision um, if, it, if, it, if it pencils out, especially with the, your uh, new crop soybean basis. Shifting back to trade, I have another question here, Chris, and, and this one's about China as well. We know their economy has slowed down and I'd have to think some of that is attributed to our current trade situation between our two economies. If we straighten that back out, do we expect China's economy to rebound, and, and will that help boost the global economy and bring us back to a full steam and quicker pace? Yeah, so I, I think a couple of things are working on China's economy right now. Um, they had uh, acquired a, a, a tremendous amount of debt, now most of it internally, as um, you know, they really have struggled to increase their domestic consumption and be less reliable on exports, which to your point there is why this trade issue has probably slowed their growth some. Now, thinking longer term, certainly if the trade issue gets straightened out and their economy begins to grow again, I do think they would come back into the market for uh, multiple agriculture products. Whether it's as fast as it was before, I'm not sure. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think it could be the issue, of course, being here in the short term and the medium term, the swine fever issue. I don't think the market has a very good perception of how bad it is there. I don't think China has a very good perception of how it is, how bad it is there. They recently took a fairly aggressive, um, 
stance on trying to spread, uh, stop the spread by essentially uh, cutting the, the country into four or five regions and saying you can't move hogs or in or out of these regions. So that, mean, that means they know they've got an issue and they're, they're really trying hard to, to, to stop it. So it's going to be hard for the market to sort out trade versus swine flu versus just the overall China economy. Um, it would certainly help to get the trade issue passed, but I'm not sure we'll ever really know how much of the growth it's adding versus the, the swine flu issue. And I think that addresses one of the questions that had come in. Uh, another one of our growers asked about the African swine fever and our ability to know exactly what impact it's had on corn and soybean demand and just how bad that it is in China. It sounds like that's uncertain. Yeah, I think the market perception is it certainly has had an impact. I would not try to venture a number on it, and I haven't seen anybody else try either, frankly. Fair enough. And I know these questions are coming a little random. We probably have time for just one or two more. Let's, let's go back to ethanol here real quick. Uh, grower asked us, doesn't E15 just really result in a shift of gallons where the coastal areas will buy the excess RINs created by the consumption of E15 and E85? Um, well, I, I think it would certainly create a shift probably out of some of the E85 gallons that are getting sold now, meaning there probably be some retailers that would, would sell less E85 and, and try to sell more E15. Really, I think the long-term opportunity for E15 is that the blending economics become such that retailers in, in, in regions see an advantage to offering E15 uh, probably um, in, in, some, in some instances in place of E10, where the blending economics uh, between E15 and E10 favor E15 and they sell more E15. I can't argue too much with the idea that you won't get much E15 penetration on the, on the coast well outside of the, of the Corn Belt. But um, if they do adjust the process for these RIN waivers a little bit and tighten that down a little bit, I think those coastal refineries or coastal blenders will have to have to do one or the other, uh, blend up a little or, or buy the RINs. Fair enough. And, and thanks for fielding all those questions. Uh, Chris, I see we're almost to our time limit here right now. And glancing at the last question or two in the queue, I think you answered those invariably uh, in catching a few of the questions before. So uh, before I give the floor back to you, Chris, for any final comments you have, just uh, on behalf of your local uh, sales team here in the Dakotas and Minnesota, hey, thanks so much, you guys, for all your business. I hope we say that often enough. We greatly appreciate it. hope everybody has a good, safe growing season in the, in the year ahead, and we're just happy to be doing business with you. So, Chris, the floor back to you, and, and thanks so much for hosting again tonight. Thanks, Mark, and if uh, I, w I would offer to you that if uh, anybody on the team or any of your uh, customers have more questions, if you they want to uh, pass them along to you and you pass them along to me, I'd be happy to answer them.